those four brothers that I told you about, part of my family, my mom and dad, we didn't have much as kids growing up, but we came from a very musical family. The Russians and Ukrainians are some of the, still some of the finest musicians in the world, and that was the culture I grew up in. And so my mom, she would, when we'd be driving in the car, she'd be singing tenor to me as we'd drive down the road. She'd, she'd sing the baritone part to my other brothers. And over the years, our family has been blessed to be able to share our music ministry in many countries around the world. Many of you have probably met the family through some of the voice of prophecy, the reunion musicals that they put together. My wife, my wife and I have been married for 44 years. We have three kids, five grandchildren. Actually, our youngest son lives not too very far from here. Um, sadly, he's not real active in the church right now. He's a wonderful father. He's a dentist. If you're looking for a really good dentist, Surprise Dentistry is where he is. But um, music has been that bond in our family that has just kind of linked us together. And we have a lot of excuses to hang out together as a family. We just got back just a few weeks ago. We did a camp meeting down in the South Island of New Zealand, provide the music for them there. Um, and uh, I want to share a song with you right now. I, I'm just curious to know, how many of you here enjoy Southern Gospel? Okay. Southern Gospel music is one of the most loved and appreciated musical styles worldwide. And, of course, Bill Gaither has been very responsible for that. I don't know how many of you get to go to the, the Great Western Quartet, uh, the convention they have here. I think it was about a month ago where a lot of those well-known quartets. Well, I love, I love gospel music. And... Um, Here's a song that's kind of my testimony, and I'm going to have, my wife wasn't able to be here today, my family, but we're going to, we're going to use some of their voices to help me here. For a long time I traveled down a long, lonely road. My heart was so heavy. In sin I sank low Then I heard about Jesus What a wonderful love I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out through His saving power Thank God I am free, free, free from this world I've been born again. Hallelujah. I'm saved, saved, saved by His wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out and show me the way. Like a bird out of prison. That's taken its flight Like the blind man that God Gave back his sight Like the poor wretched beggar Who found fortune and fame I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out through his holy name Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. Washed in the blood of Jesus, I've been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, saved by His wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out. With us. He had one of the most incredible basses, and this is what he would do in this song. He would do something like this. Free from this world of sin, washed in the blood of Jesus, been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, 
saved by His wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out and show me the way. I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out and show me A couple of folk have asked me about my parents. Um, many of you have known them. Talked with a few folk here that I guess my dad held some evangelistic meetings in Michigan when you were there. And we lost mom. She passed away five years ago. And dad passed away about two years ago. And the last summer, we, all the five brothers, we got together and had an incredible experience. We went back to the little Russian church up there in Beaver Creek, Saskatchewan, and right just a few miles from where I grew up as a kid. And there we laid their ashes in that little Russian cemetery, waiting for the great day when, when Jesus is going to return. Call forth those who've gone before us. I miss my dad and mom. But you know what? In this journey, to those who are believers, you never have to say, goodbye. All you have to do is say, I'm going to see you in the morning. And this weekend is an incredible weekend. You know, I know, and I don't want to get into the debate about, you know, that the, all the culture and the traditions surrounding Christmas and Easter. Let me just say this. This is an opportunity for people of faith to tell the story. The greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever experienced. Because of all the great prophets and all the great men that have gone before us, there's only one story that we can tell where the tomb is empty. And that's what the world is looking at. You know, I understand tomorrow. In fact, I'm going to go sneak over there. I'm going to check it out. I understand there's going to be like 50 or 60,000 Christians over there in the, in the Phoenix Stadium tomorrow celebrating Easter Sunday. Yeah. They've hired the whole stadium. This is going to be more exciting than the Super Bowl. I'm going to tell you that right now. But it's an opportunity for us to share the greatest story I've ever, ever told. This morning, I'm so glad to see a lot of young people here. I've been in my ministry. I was a teacher for a number of years, and I became a youth pastor and a youth director. I have spent all my ministry ministering to young people. I love our kids dearly. We have some of the greatest kids in the world in our church. Oh, I know, there's many of them that make some pretty foolish decisions, and we look at them, you know, we kind of wonder. Let me just tell you something. There's a whole bunch of old people out there making stupid decisions, too. Age has no barrier of making stupid decisions. Thank you, my friend. But to see our young people in action, and through the years, I've discovered something. I've had kids come up to me years later and say, remember that story you told at Bible camp? Remember that story you told at Pathfinders? I still remember that. I'm going to share a story with you today that I guarantee you, you'll never forget. And it has everything to do with the Easter story. The setting is a very simple home in the wheat fields, the plains of Saskatchewan, Canada. It's a springtime. It happens to be Easter. Jimmy and Lisa, the minute they walked into the door of their home that afternoon after school, they knew that he was coming again. You see, Mom had spent all day. She spent all week preparing, decorating the house, cooking, putting all kinds of fresh flowers, making the house just look an incredible place to hang out. And now mom's back in the kitchen cooking all of the foods that made this weekend, this special Easter weekend, so special. But mom never made apple dumplings or that fabulous carrot cake unless he was coming. As Jimmy walked in the door, he hung his head. He said, oh, not again. Under his breath, he walked through the door. 
Jimmy, Lisa, oh, I'm so glad you're home, Mom shouted from the kitchen. I need your help in here. Come quickly. Oh, Mom, I have final exams this next week. I need to study. I got work to do. But see, Jimmy and Lisa knew without a shadow of a doubt that when Mom asked for help in the kitchen, there was no arguing. See, Mom could give that look that said something like this. You know, that'll be enough out of you, young lady or young man. So Lisa and Jimmy, they trudged into the kitchen to help Mom with the final preparations. But as they were helping in the kitchen, the realization hit them that, that you know what? We're really in for an extra treat. It's an extra bonus. I mean, this is going to be a fabulous meal. Oh. So Mom, you see, Mom went all out for him. And so Lisa, her job was to set the table with the finest china and the finest silverware that they had. This was tableware and china that was handed down from their great-grandma. They couldn't afford it. And those crystal goblets, they were only used for the very, very special occasions. The table was all set. Their favorite foods out there, fresh green salad, sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes and gravy, homemade vegetable soup, turkey and all the, f all the dressings, homemade cranberry sauce, hot homemade whole wheat bread still warming in the oven. You know, even the aroma in the air had calories. You get the scene. I see Jimmy, he couldn't wait to dig in. I mean, who knew, he knew what he was going for first. He was going for those mashed potatoes and gravy. I mean, he could have a whole meal just on that. He could fill his whole plate up and be happy. Mom said, now quickly, go get cleaned up. Get your change of clothes. Because Mr. Stevens will be here any minute now. And sure enough, just as Mom and Dad were walking down the stairs, their fresh clothes changed, coming out of their bedroom, right on time, there was a knock on the front door. Mom and Dad, they hurried to the front door. Jimmy and Lisa followed. They knew what it meant to have good manners. They were there to greet their guest. They opened the door, and there he was. Oh, Mom said, oh, Mr. Stevens, it is so good to see you again. Welcome into our home. And Dad, he said, oh, he just hugged Mr. Stevens. We're so honored that you came. Here, let me help you with your coat, your hat, your scarf, and gloves. It's still kind of cold out tonight. You see up there in northern Canada, even in the springtime, there were nights when it was very cold. Such was the night that Mr. Stevens came. And with that, Mr. Stevens took off his coat. He unwrapped the, the, the scarf that was on his face, he took his hat and his coat and his gloves. Dad put him in the, in the coat rack. And as he unwrapped that scarf, from, that scarf from his face, there he was. Oh, the ugliest face that you'd ever seen. His face and hands were just covered with scars. His lips were kind of, they were scarred together so that they were kind of molded into this perennial sneer. Several of his fingers were, were welded, welded together with scar tissue. He was so hard to look at. I mean, he made Jimmy shiver with the creeps. Mr. Stevens looked at Lisa and Jimmy and said, Oh, my, look at you young ones. Look how much you've grown. And then he took one of his scarred hands and he scruffed little Jimmy's head, his hair. Ooh, that just sent down the heebie-jeebies down his spine. I mean, it was just so gross. Now, everyone in the area knew Mr. Stevens. All the kids at school knew him. In fact, they, they gave him a nickname. They called him Old Scarface. Not to his face, of course. But that's what they called him, Old Scarface. Now, they even made fun of him and how ugly he was. And one of the kids said, oh, man, to see him in a dream, that'd be like a scary nightmare. And then they would laugh. When Mr. Stevens looked at Lisa, he winked at her, and then he graciously extended his hand, and she did the same. But, oh, his hands felt so weird. 
They went to the front room, to the living room, and they sat down. They exchanged a few minutes of pleasantries and conversation. And then mom invited Mr. Stevens and the family into the dining room for, for the supper, for the feast. Mr. Stevens was seated. He was, he was seated at the head of the table. He was the honored guest. Dad had a prayer, prayer of blessing on the meal. And then he shared his favorite part of the Easter story. He always loved the part about the empty tomb. That was his favorite part. So dad just loved to read it. So he read it from the Bible. And then they dug in for the feast that mom had prepared. Yeah, you're right. Jimmy went for the mashed potatoes right away. And, and that serving bowl was right in front of him. Now mom gave Jimmy that look again in her eye that said, now young man, don't be a little pig and take it all for yourself. Just remember, there's, there's five of us around this table. So Jimmy took one average size serving of mashed potatoes and gravy. But boy, he knew he'd, he'd be good for seconds. Now Mr. Stevens took very modest portions of all the food that mom had prepared. His plate was full. I'm not sure if I, am I okay with it? Yeah. His plate was full. But now came the hard part. You see, now they had to watch Mr. Stevens eat. And it was one of the grossest things you could ever see. You see, Mr. Stevens' face was so scarred, they had a hard time getting food into his, into his mouth without it, you know, dripping down his scarred chin. And his hands were so scarred, he had a hard time holding a spoon or a fork with any kind of dignity. And, and he just kind of, you know, shoveled the food into his mouth and then very quickly he'd wipe the food off of his chin as it dribbled down. But Jimmy just couldn't help sneaking a glance out of the corner of his eye. And uh, I don't know what it is about human beings that, you know, our human nature that makes us want to stare and look at the unusual, but that's what happened with Jimmy. But it was so gross. During the course of the meal, there were several times when Jimmy and Lisa made some comments that were not very nice. You know, things like about having more important things to do, you know, like study and prepare for exams. But again, mom didn't need to say anything. She just shot that glance of their eye that basically said, that'll be enough out of you. But then before long, ah, here came the dessert. Apple dumplings, ice cream, and the best carrot cake you would ever have tasted. Oh, Jimmy and Lisa, especially Jimmy, he just stuffed himself. He was just, oh, so full. So he sat back and realized that this feast was over. Mr. Stevens, in his gentle and kind way, turned to Mom and said, Thank you. Thank you for the best meal I've ever eaten. <laughs> Mom chuckled. You're too kind. But now that dinner was over, the children knew that the table had to be cleared and the dishes had to be washed before they could do any of their own stuff. But not tonight. That would wait until Mr. Stevens was gone. So they all went into the living room and they sat down on the couch and the sofa together and mom knew that Mr. Stevens loved to hear the London Sym Symphony Orchestra. And she had special this is in the days of the long play record albums, and she put a couple of those records on, and they sat there, and they just listened to some of his favorites, that beautiful music. And after a couple of the songs, they turned the music off, and then they began to talk and to chat, to reminisce, to share. And sure enough, it was just a matter of time that Mr. Stevens started talking about life and the old days back in the farm again. Those days that Mr. Stevens, he'd, he'd be out in the field plowing behind two of the smartest and the biggest and the best-looking work mules in the country. You see, he had named his work mules Ned and Jed. They were twins. 
And the children, they'd heard all these stories before, but you know how it is with older folk. You know, they tell the same stories over and over again, thinking they're all new. How long would they have to endure this? But you see, in their home, they knew children would be seen and not heard, so they sat there and listened respectfully. Listen to Mr. Stevens' stories. They had heard many times how Ned and Jed were the smartest and the strongest mules in the land. Now see, those are in the days when modern tractors and, and the big machinery that, that only the wealthy farmers could afford, they were very, very rare and scarce. Mr. Stevens would get a big smile on his face when he'd tell the children that when they were plowing in the field and it was the end of the work day, Quitting time, Ned and Jed would stop dead in their tracks in the middle of the field. They'd wait to get unhitched. Then they'd head straight for the barn and the drinking trough. And let me tell you what. You better make sure that the plows are unhooked and that you're hanging on because they were thirsty and hungry and they were heading home to the barn. And he'd laugh. The way, you, the way Mr. Stevens talked, you would think that Ned and Jed were super mules. Yeah, Ned could count to ten, Mr. Stevens would say. For example, seven. Ned would stamp his right front hoof seven times. Four plus three, Jed. He'd stomp his foot nine times. Yep. They were the smartest mules in the land. Now, there are other stories that the children heard many, many times. Boring. And Jimmy and Lisa weren't sure how long Mr. Stevens was going to hang around, but before long, because they knew they were, they were anxious to get stuff that they wanted to do, but before long, Mr. Stevens announced that he had to go home, that he wouldn't be able to stay any longer because he, he had to go feed the chickens and make sure his dogs were okay. So Mom and Dad, they got up and, Escorted him to the front door. They gave him his coat and his hat, his scarf, his gloves. And then mom and dad again gave Mr. Stevens a big hug. Mom even kissed him on the cheek. Ooh, how could she do that? But the children were there also to say goodbye. And so they kindly said farewell and goodbye to Mr. Stevens. There Mr. Stevens, he got in his pickup truck and he started heading home and the children knew they headed, they didn't have upstairs, they headed straight for the kitchen because they knew they had to clean up the kitchen, do the dishes before they headed upstairs to do the stuff that they thought was more important, like call their friends and study for exams. And after they cleaned up the kitchen and the dining room, Mom turned to Lisa and Jimmy and said, you know, children, there were several times tonight that I got the impression that you had more important things to do. I wasn't too impressed by some of your attitudes tonight. Now, I need to talk to you for a few minutes. Oh, no. Okay, the children thought. But then Mom continued, Either you have forgotten, or I have never told you the whole story of how Mr. Stevens got those scars. Sure, we know, Jimmy said. You know, he got caught in some kind of a brush fire or something back in the olden days. Yeah, we know the story. Well, Jimmy and Lisa, I want you to sit down for a few minutes so I can refresh your memory a bit. <coughs> so Mom began to tell the children about Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens, who, who had one of the largest farms in the whole country, had many hired hands to help him. I mean, he had a huge operation. He had several teams of mules that were work mules. Ned and Jed, of course, were his favorite. <clears throat> and Mom continued to tell him, and she said, you know, it was late one summer, just before harvest, when Mr. Stevens was out in the field plowing with Ned and Jed. It was hot. Ned and Jed were the strongest work mules. They could actually pull a three-bottom plow. Now, some of you farmers may, may know what that is, and but some of you may, some of you kids need to look up what it means, a three-bottom plow. But they were strong. Whoa, Mr. Stevens said that day as he tugged on the reins. Stopped to take a drink from that thermos that he had tied to the plow. 
He wiped his brow and whew, he was sweating hot. And he turned around. He turned around to see where the clouds were coming from. But they weren't clouds. It was smoke. Huge brush fire had erupted. And all you could see was fire and smoke on the horizon. And in that part of the country, brush fires were feared. I mean, once they started, they would sweep through a countryside in a matter of minutes, bringing every, burning everything in its path. That waist-high tinder brush and weeds would, would just explode into flames. Oh, no, Mr. Stevens said. That brush fire is heading right towards this little schoolhouse where the teacher and nine children were there. I must do something quickly. So he unhooked Ned and Jed. He jumped on the back of Ned, grabbed the reins of Jed, and he galloped full speed toward the barn. Before Ned and Jed had even stopped, he jumped off and he shouted at them, Stay! They stayed. He ran in the barn and he grabbed three horse blankets, you know, the kind that keep animals warm in the, in the wintertime, and he threw them in the farm wagon. And then he hooked up Ned and Jed to the farm wagon and he shouted, Giddy up! And away they went at full speed, galloping as fast as they could. They headed straight to that little schoolhouse, which is a mile away. When they got to that schoolhouse, he ran up the steps of the school and he very calmly and very quietly walked up to Miss Campbell, the teacher, up to her desk. Now, when the students saw Mr. Stevens enter the classroom, this handsome, strong, loving, fun-loving man, they stood to their feet at attention and as they were taught to say, good afternoon, Mr. Stevens. <laughs> oh, I never get tired of, of seeing you wonderful children. He'd say, you always put a smile on my face. Please be seated. But then he walked up. And he leaned down <clears throat> and he began to whisper something into Miss Campbell's ear. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I don't want you to be, be real scared, but there's a brush fire that has erupted not too far away. And we need to get the children safe. Mr. Stevens, I mean, he's so calm, so collected. What? exclaimed the teacher. For you see, the fire was approaching from the direction where there are no windows in the school. And so... Nobody could see this fire coming, but it, was, it wasn't that far away. And so the teacher, Miss Campbell, she stood and said, Children, please, quickly, I want you to go to the cloakroom. I want you to get your coats. I want you to get your lunch pails. I want you to go right away. I want you to listen to Mr. Stevens. So Mr. Stevens instructed the nine children, that little school, the little country schoolhouse, a little school like I went to when I was in first and second grade. He instructed to come out. And stand right next to the wagon that he had brought up, that he had that he brought to the school, and he'd safely get them all home. Many of their farms are several miles away, but he said, "Don't worry, children." So the children immediately went outside, and they climbed into the farm wagon. They sat on the blankets that Mr. Stevens had brought. And just as they were getting ready to leave the schoolyard, nature played a very cruel trick. If you see that fire. That fire had caused these whirlwinds of thermal heat. And some of those tumbleweeds had caught on fire and they began to blow and they began to blow in a reverse direction. And before they knew it, the entire school was now surrounded by a huge wall of fire. Oh no. The children, the teacher, were in grave danger. So Mr. Stevens ordered the children to get out of the wagon again and he grabbed those blankets that they were sitting on and he took them to the drinking trough not too far away and he dunked those blankets in the drinking trough so they were soaking wet. Then he ran back to the wagon and he told the children to get back into the wagon to lie flat on the floor of the wagon. They needed to stack themselves in there just kind of like firewood. The teacher and the bigger children on the bed lie on the bottom and the smaller children on top and then he took those wet soaking blankets and he covered them and he tucked those blankets in so that none of their skin was exposed. He took his jean jacket and he tore that jacket in two and he tied the sleeves of those, of those jackets, he tied the ends of them together and he put one of those sleeves over Jed's nose and the other over Ned's nose to keep the smoke out as a filter for he knew what had to, what had to happen took a piece of baling twine and he tied the sleeves to the halter to make sure that those sleeves would stay in place and wouldn't fall off when those mules began to gallop. The wall of fire is getting closer and closer and closer. The children and teacher could already feel the heat of it. It was just like licking the back of their necks. And they all started to cry, Oh, help us. Don't worry, said Mr. Stevens. I'll get you out of this mess. And with that, Mr. Stevens jumped onto the seat of that farm wagon, and with a crack of the reins and the shout, Giddy up, 
Ned and Jed took off in a full gallop right towards that wall of fire. And as obedient as those mules were, they ran right through that fire, that white hot fire. Those wet blankets that were covering the children and the teacher began to sizzle and they began to steam. I mean, they felt like they were in a pressure cooker, like they were getting cooked alive. And they were screaming and crying, oh, we're going to die, we're going to die, please help us. <coughs> but in less than a minute, the wagon came to a stop. The children threw back the sizzling blankets and realized that they were safe. Hooray, we're safe! Yay, yay, they shouted. And the only other sound you could hear at that moment, besides the sizzling blankets and the roaring fire that they passed through, was the sound of Ned and Jed crying in agony as they fell to their knees with all of their hair and all of their bodies still burning and on fire. And there they took their last breath. Miss Campbell cried, Oh, thank you, Lord, we're safe. And they looked at Ned and Jed, and all of them ran to those bodies that were lying breathlessly on the ground. Mr. Stevens, we need to do something for Ned and Jed. And Miss Campbell turned to thank Mr. Stevens and asked for help for the mules. Oh, no, she cried. No. There was Mr. Stevens crumpled over in the seat of that wagon, his hands and feet, his coat still on fire, burned beyond recognition. He was barely breathing. Now by this time, a number of the nearby farmers, the parents of those students, had seen the fire and were just now pulling into the schoolyard with their farm wagons to get the children to safety. But now there are more important things to do. Right away, they loaded Mr. Stevens onto one of the wagons, and as quickly as the horses would gallop, they took him to the, to the local hospital, which is 20 miles away. And by the time they got there, Mr. Stevens had lost consciousness. He was nearly dead. And for many, many months afterwards, they weren't sure if Mr. Stevens would live. But because he was so strong, and the farmers and their wives took such incredible care of him, round the clock, he lived. But he was scarred beyond recognition. This man who was once so strong and handsome was now so weak and scarred and ugly. And then as mom continued telling the story, and this is where I have a hard part, she began to cry uncontrollably. Oh, how the tears flowed. She just cried and cried and cried. And then she looked at the children and she said, children, the reason we love Mr. Stevens so much is because I was one of the little girls in that wagon. Mr. Stevens saved my life. I was one of those little girls. Oh, you might see Mr. Stevens, old Scarface as you call him. You might see him as ugly and gross. Oh, but children to me, he's the most handsome, he's the most wonderful man in the world, next to your dad, of course. He saved my life. He gave everything for me and those other children in the wagon. And now for the very first time, Lisa and Jimmy knew the whole story. And tears started to fall down their faces. Now they recognized a love that was much, much more than they could ever understand. And from that moment on, they were different. It really made a huge difference in their lives. You see, several months later, when the family invited Mr. Stevens over for a birthday party, the minute he walked into the home, into their home, Jimmy and Lisa went up to him and hugged him and kissed him like you would not believe. Oh, Mr. Stevens, now that we know the rest of the story, thank you, thank you. We love you so much. Thank you for what you did for Mom. How could we ever thank you enough? Now, Mr. Stevens got a big smile on his face because he had heard that Jimmy started punching out one of his classmates at school that was making fun of Mr. Stevens. You don't talk about my friend like that. You don't know the rest of the story like I do. I said, so you know what? Jimmy chose to stand up in front of his whole class 
to tell them why he was sticking up for Mr. Stevens. And he told them the whole story of why he was such a great man and such a great hero. And you know what? All of Jimmy and Lisa's classmates got, the, got a whole new picture of Mr. Stevens that day. And Mr. Stevens became a friend and a hero to all of them. And they never again made fun of him. He became one of their best friends. In fact, they invited him in many, many times to come and share stories in their classroom. He became their hero. What a man. What a hero. His scars are ugly to some, but oh so beautiful to those who know the whole story. You know, and I know, another story. The Easter story. What a man. What a hero. The scars on his hands and his feet may be ugly to some, but oh, so beautiful to those who know the rest of the story. Jesus, that baby that we celebrate at Christmas time, lying in a manger, who grew to be a great storytelling man, the God who walked on this earth and healed the sick, raised the dead, opened the eyes of the blind, unstopped the ears of the deaf, that Jesus allowed himself to be hung and tortured on a cross. And you know what? Throughout eternity, we will be able to see those scars in his hands and his feet and know, just like Jimmy and Lisa, the rest of the greatest story that has ever been told. Do you love Jesus this morning? I know I do. And those scars, I know the rest of the story. And throughout eternity, I'm going to brag on Jesus to the universe. I'm going to brag on Jesus because I know what the scars of Jesus mean to me. Jesus is the cornerstone Came for sinners to atone Though rejected by his own He became the cornerstone Jesus is the cornerstone when I am by sin oppressed on that stone I am at rest where the seeds of truth are sown he remains my cornerstone, Jesus is my cornerstone. Rock of
secure for all time he shall endure till his children reach their home he remains the cornerstone till the breaking of the dawn till our footsteps cease to run ever let this truth be known Jesus is the cornerstone Jesus is the Jesus is my cornerstone. Father God, all we can say is thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to go through such agony for me. Lord, throughout eternity, we're going to be able to see those scars and be reminded of the greatest story ever told. Lord, we love you today. We want to serve you. We want to be faithful to you. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that maybe has not made a full commitment to follow you. Lord, I just pray that you would just work on their hearts. As they understood through this story of Scarface, really what the whole story is all about. How much, how much you love us. Lord, we can't do anything but give that love back to you in return. We thank you and praise you in your wonderful and holy name. And everybody said together, Amen. I just happened to see the clock there, and I've gone over time here. I just needed just a couple more minutes of your time this morning, and then we're going to... I'm smelling some of the good potluck out there. We are going to be taking a special love offering right now. As I shared with you earlier this morning, I still have a heart for missions. Many of you have maybe been following the news of this little island out in the South Pacific. It's near Tonga. It's near... Uh, New Zealand, is the island of Vanuatu. They've been totally devastated by a Category 5 cyclone, hurricane. Most of their churches are gone. They don't even have forestation to rebuild churches with local materials. My family, we plan to take a, a group over there next year to help rebuild several of those churches and do evangelism. Let's just have a, a quick prayer before... Um, before you receive that offering, <coughs> bless you. Let's just bow our heads. Before you receive that offering, though, this love offering is going to be used specifically for that project. I, more than anything, want to take my grandkids. So I'm raising funds to, for our ministry to, to take them. My grandkids have way too much stuff. And if you know what I'm, under, what I'm talking about, they got the iPads, and they, you know, they, got they need to go and experience and see people who are happier than we are, and they don't have any stuff. I want them to see what it means to be rich toward God. So that's what your offer is going to go for. Father God, right now, we want to pray and ask a blessing on this offering. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege you've given us of serving you. We thank you and praise you throughout eternity. For your name we pray. Amen. If you want to make out a check, you can make it just to Meloshenko Music, and, and we'll do it that way. But there's one other way you can help us. Okay, gentlemen and ladies, you can receive the offering now. Or have you already done so? Oh, there's one other way you can help us as we, res as we generate funds 
for these mission projects. Our family has produced nine CDs and three DVDs. We don't sell them on Sabbath, but we make them available on our Sabbath system, on a faith system. In the fellowship lunch area after church, we'll have a display there set up. You can take whatever you want. All you need to do is fill out a form and you send us payment at a later time, knowing that all the proceeds are going to get help in this mission project. So that'll be out there in just a, just a few minutes after church. Again, I want to thank Pastor Taylor for giving me the invitation to be here and to join this wonderful church family. I am just so impressed with the, I would just, I'm, I'm going to be really honest with you. The favorite churches for me to visit are the multicultural churches that we have. That all the different flavors and all the different nationalities, it's a beautiful thing to experience. And I want to thank you for your warmth and your friendship this morning. And um, with that, let's all bow our heads. And now may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. And everybody said, Amen.